Hi everybody, it's Kate Millikan, the founder of My Counterpain for My Counterpain One-on-One, -on -one. and today I am here with Dr. Stephen Krieger, who is a neurologist and specialist at the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for MS at Mount Sinai, New York City. I am thrilled to also admit to the world that Dr. Krieger is my neurologist. Um, he was with me when I was diagnosed. He's been with me for over a decade, and I was especially thrilled to take on this subject that we're going to talk about today with him because I lived the experience with them, and that is new diagnoses and the fear of the unknown. So, Dr. Krieger, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, you have now been a neurologist for over a decade, and you have seen patient after patient get diagnosed. What is it like uh, from your perspective when patients get word that they have been diagnosed with MS? Well, I think, number one, um, people respond very differently to difficult news, and I think getting an MS diagnosis is never easy uh, for anybody. Um, it's probably the only thing that everyone has in common is that it's, it's difficult news for, for anybody who receives it. Now, because I work at a multiple sclerosis center, and it says Corey Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis on the door, um, it's not a huge surprise for someone when we first have that conversation because they're in our center for that reason. So it is often not the very first time that they've ever heard it or ever thought about it when they come to me, but uh, something about coming to an MS center and sitting down with a neurologist and hearing those words, I think makes it real, you know, and new for everybody that gets newly diagnosed. Um, so I think that's hard for people, no question. Um, what people, if, go ahead. No, I was going to say people approach it very, very differently. It's, uh, I think for some people, it, they believe it immediately. Um, it, it's, a, it's a validation in some ways of the fact that they don't feel right and they want to know what's wrong and they have long believed that something's not wrong and now there's a name for it and a diagnosis and full speed ahead. And I think for other people, particularly those who feel well, um, getting a diagnosis like multiple sclerosis makes no sense to them at all. And they reject it out of hand uh, because how could it be uh, that they have this diagnosis? And so I think it really ranges from immediate acceptance to complete rejection and everything in between. I, I feel like in the world of MS, too, that, you know, more and more, I think MS has become more common, but certainly I think there's a feeling of not really understanding what it is in the first place. So kind of getting a grasp on that. And one thing I would say, certainly, probably its shining characteristic is that MS is individual for everybody. How do you try to convey that to patients and caregivers? Well, you know, you... you pose this as the fear of the unknown, and I think the, the unknown and the variability go hand in hand here. I think the unknown and the unpredictability go hand in hand. Um, and there are still things that we struggle to predict and struggle to be able to tell someone uh, you know, in a definitive way, and I think that that can be very unsettling for people. Um, in some ways, the unknown or not having a certainty of prognosis or a certainty of what the experience of having MS will be like, in some ways that unknown is the worst part about this diagnosis. Um, worse in some ways than more traditional bad news. You know, more traditional news of you've got a bad diagnosis and, and something bad is going to happen. This is different. This is a difficult diagnosis to hear and to receive, but it doesn't necessarily mean a bad prognosis for everybody. And, and the goal is for it not to be a bad prognosis for people. And I think that uncertainty is very, very challenging to convey and challenging to, uh, to hear. I think about the fact that for people that come in with a diagnosis, they often present with symptoms. And in some way, when you're in the moment experiencing the symptoms, you can, you can really get a grasp of them. Um, I have to believe there are a lot of people that come through the door, I certainly was one, of trying to quantify it, trying to put it in some sort of framework. Is there anything you can talk about in that regard? Well, you know, some people will say, and I don't know if there's really data to back this up, but some people will say that even a, an unremittingly terrible diagnosis like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, which 
basically only goes one way. Um, that people are less depressed with that diagnosis than with MS. Wow. Now, I don't, I don't know if there's 100% data to support that conjecture, but you know, that really speaks to the fact that the uncertainty of the disease can be as overwhelming as the certainty of something bad. And I think that's psychologically very important. And, and I try to remember that, that if I'm gonna tell someone, this is a very variable condition, you have a good chance to do well, they might still walk away from it more depressed and more upset by that uncertainty than and if I'd said there's no chance of doing well, yeah. which as a clinician, is, I have to remember that. I have to stay aware of that because I might think I'm giving someone good news by saying, you know, right. the prognosis is uncertain and we can do things, but I, it needs to be put to the positive. To your question about quantifying it, it it's hard. Um, and part of that is we like to quantify things. Part of it too is that you know, we've all grown up watching medical TV in one way or another, um, be it ER or whatever. And, you know, the way doctors are always portrayed is giving people numbers. You've got a 5% chance of this, or 10 days this will happen, or you've got three months to live. And the fact is, we never say things like that, really. Right. It's, it's almost impossible to be right. Uh, in anything, right? Yeah. I mean, you always, you, you never have a certain knowledge that everybody's going to act one way. Right, right. And so I think people are sort of bred to expect the doctor puts on the white coat and says things in a very definitive, quantified way. And yet I try not to do that um, because I'm, I'm likely to be wrong. And even in MS in particular, you know, when we talk about the rationale for treatment and our disease modifying therapies, what they're doing is reducing the risk of things. And we know that based on clinical trials and data, thousands of people followed for dozens of years. But it's hard to just give that to one person and say, your risk is reduced by X percent. Right. I can't do that for the individual person, but I do want her to understand what that data means, where it comes from, and how we can use that to make good decisions and give someone their best possible chance of doing well. Talk about for you as you go through this uh, incredibly poignant conversation with the patient and the caregiver, how much you are working with a philosophy of listening to people react with, let's say, you know, fear, sadness, and a half empty perspective versus you personally thinking half full. How do you work with that? And, and you know, me personally, I try to be as half full as possible with my patients, but, uh, you know, I, I'm on a, on a personal level. I mean, I'm not always a half full kind of person. I think anybody who's universally, you know, blindly optimistic, I think, you know, is, lacks a certain nuance. So I try to come at it, you know, sensitive to, to sensitive to pessimism and, uh, and, and bring some optimism to that. I think Because it's real and it's serious. It is. And if you're facing uncertainty, I think it, it brings out someone's underlying personality structure. You know, I think people, people come into the room having lived a, an adult life or a young adult life. They, they are who they are. And I think facing something challenging just brings out someone's underlying personality. Someone who approaches everything with, I'm going to hit this as hard as I can and be relentlessly positive and broadcast it to the world. That's a certain person. Yeah. That's who you were walking into the room, uh, you know, a decade ago. Not everybody is like that. Not everybody can be like that. And so, you know, I try to take things that I've learned from people like, like you, and how can we take that and try and apply a little bit of that thinking to someone for whom that kind of relentless optimism doesn't come as naturally? How can you do that and make that a good fit for someone? So I try to talk about uncertainty and the range of possible outcomes as a positive. Do you here's feel? We don't know, here's what we can do. Do you feel that you know? So so far, with, in terms of my MS, I've been uh, doing so well and not had a significant relapse for a number of years. Talk to me about the spirit you find for people uh, who are much more progressed in terms of positive attitude and how you see that making an impact in their lives, even if they are debilitated. You know, I think that people imagine that they will feel worse about things that could occur than they actually will. 
this is a this is sort of a it's a deep concept in a sense it's something that in in the sort of behavioral literature and in the philosophy literature is called affective forecasting okay. how we think we're going to feel if certain things happen so someone might say to me newly diagnosed that if if she's ever in a wheelchair her life is over that's it hmm. and i can never respond no you won't feel that way that's i mean i can never one can never say that one can never know that about someone else but i'll tell you i take care of a lot of people who have real significant physical disability they use walkers they use wheelchairs they use scooters and their lives are not over they don't think of their lives as being over they've adapted they have adjusted they've persevered obviously things have not gone the way i want it to as their neurologist necessarily or i may have taken over their care 20 or 30 years into this disease but a lot of people who use scooters and crutches and walkers who live incredibly full and dynamic lives who are contributing who are working or retired or traveling whatever they're doing and i'm sure that they felt the same way 40 years earlier if they ever needed a wheelchair it would all be over and that turned out not to be the case and so i try to respect that i try to foster that and and allow people to adapt to their physical abilities adapt to their capabilities and and make the most of it and yet not be sort of full of platitudes you know uh, along the way i think you have to be honest and genuine with someone uh i love that and i feel you know if we're going to kind of get philosophical i feel that when you start the ms journey and you get the diagnosis all you see is a linear progression to doom right and i have felt through my own experience that that as you start living and accepting and managing and getting perspective all of a sudden in some ways the journey kind of starts getting vertical can you comment on that i i think that people imagine their lives as sort of a, a linear path in everything you yeah. know we're in our careers or in our relationships or you know we're going to hit certain milestones at certain points in time i think the truth is that for all of us disease or no disease ms or not i think that life takes more turns than we anticipate and when we look back our life has taken more turns than we might even realize to get us to where we are right um and i think that part of adapting to the unknown or the uncertainties of an ms diagnosis is an intrinsic ability to be flexible be responsive uh, be able to 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 adapt and and respond when things get thrown in the way that you didn't anticipate and what i try to do as the doctor since my my piece of it in some ways is small you know but what i try to do as the doctor is frame it as there's uncertainty but we know what we're going to do if certain things happen if a right. relapse happens we know how we'll treat it if a mri scan changes we know what other options we have for treatment if symptoms emerge fatigue pain whatever they may be there are things that we can do about those things so that when the unexpected occurs there's a plan in place or the at least the sensibility that there will be a plan in place i think that's how i try to counteract the uncertainty with the response team myself and and the people here at our center um my patient and their family and their friends and their support team so that it's not one person facing uncertainty alone but a team of people and a response plan in place whatever may occur i almost feel like that's kind of like putting uh, a foothold into uh something that's abstract that you have like a concrete thing to kind of base your thoughts around are there any other footholds that you have found over time that have been helpful in terms of things you say to your patients and also your caregivers by the way i mean i don't know if you feel like you're talking to them differently in the same meeting or not um but what are some things that you have found have been helpful to those people well i mean i do talk to care providers and family members and, and whoever someone brings with them um you know when when we're in the waiting room and someone says can my mom come or can my husband come and like of course yeah you know what could you imagine if i said no they must be <laughs> out I know and I'm locking the door. Right. You want you want them in the room. Um you want them in the room, you want them in the discussion. And I think, you know, they they are an important foothold physically and then also to help to reinforce 
the kinds of things that, that I'm trying to allow someone to understand. Um, you know, because again, I get, I get a few minutes with someone to say these things, and I think they bear repeating, and people need to hear them over and over again. So, yeah, I think there's people as footholds. I think there are milestones that I, I try to look to for someone. You know, their, their first one-year scan, I want it to be stable. If it's not stable, I want them to know what the plan's going to be to respond to that. Um, I want someone to be well without new symptoms for five years. That's a big milestone for someone to say, look, I've been doing this for five years, and, and here's how I'm doing, here's how well I'm doing, or here's what the challenges have been. Um, I want people to look at the milestones in, in our field. How about that? It's footholds, not just in someone's life, but in the field of MS and MS research and treatment. I, I've come to saying to people now, someone's newly diagnosed with MS, and, and she says, what am I gonna be able to do in 10 years? Hmm. You know, am I gonna be impaired in 10 years in some way? I'll talk about that, but then I'll also say, look, it's not just what you can do in 10 years. Mm. What are we going to be able to do in 10 years? That's awesome. That we can't do now. And, and I, I try to make sure that people understand that it's not just the condition that might be dynamic. It's our field that's dynamic and we change along with it. I, um, you know, I would say as we finish up here, when uh, you and I were together and I was first diagnosed, you were a fellow. And as a result of you being a fellow, I had the opportunity to book a 45 minute appointment, even though I had been diagnosed, even though I was on a therapy, um, just to talk about the fear of, un of the unknown. And for me, what I remember is recognizing that the unknown is so abstract um, and really getting to talk very concretely about the abstract. And what I was left with was a feeling of perspective about it that I feel like set the course of my healing. So I, I would love for you just to close with talking about um, the importance of perspective in this moment as people kind of progress with their MS journey and your best advice for someone watching this today. Well, I, you know, I think um, this whole conversation today has been about this perspective too. And uh, the idea of, of spending a lot of time talking about these things with people is something that's important to me as a, as a doctor. It has not been important to the way healthcare has moved in the last 10 years. So it's harder and harder for us to, to have that protected time in a sense to, to talk through these things. Right. Um, but I still try to preserve it as, as much as we can. Um, you know, I think one thing that we talk about a lot and you've talked about a lot is the fact that MS is a community and there's a community of people who are there to share their information and, and resources. Um, this is a community that nobody ever asks to join. And yet, then someone's in it. And I think that it takes different people different amounts of time to come around to wanting that information, wanting that perspective. I think some people want to banish it first and maybe come to a growing acceptance of it in their own way. Um, and so what I would say to anybody watching this now who's newly diagnosed or even someone who's not, in a sense, there's always, I think, a part of it that's not real or that one has to kind of, I don't know, face again, face anew every time you get an MRI scan done. Or every that's time right. Or there's some sort of progression in some domain. Right. And I, I think what I would say is that, you know, it's, it's never going to feel perfectly under control. Waiting for it to feel perfectly under control, I think, is a setup for, for never feeling that way. Um, the perspective, I think, comes from knowing that there are, are always going to be some degree of uncertainty around it and being as comfortable with that as possible. And remembering, too, that, you know, there's uncertainty before you get a diagnosis. There's uncertainty after. And, you know, there's this sort of desire to control everything in, in ways that we can't. But I think if we remember how much agency we do have as clinicians to make this better, and then how much agency our, our patients, people with MS have, to take good care of themselves, to be proactive. Personal power. Personal power, positive health-related activities and behaviors. Um, you know, this is not a linear path to doom, as you said. It's not a linear path, 
and it's not a path to doom. And I think that's the perspective that I want people to have is that it's a, it's a variable path and hopefully it's a path to as, as much success and well-being uh, as we can achieve now and as we'll be able to achieve in the years to come.